Are you ready to alter your life? Because that's what's about to happen. If you're looking for a judgment-free zone where TMI doesn't exist, to have the conversations you're not supposed to have, and explore how to make small yet substantial, sustainable changes in your life to actually care for and empower yourself through physical and emotional fitness, then you're in the right place. I'm your host, Alyssa Alter, M-O-M-D-O-N, the Amy Poehler of vaginas, author, speaker, coach, former Broadway performer, certified Pilates instructor, pelvic health expert, comedian, co-founder of postpartum.com, mom on the mend, and board certified doctor of nothing. I believe that if we put as much time, energy, and discipline on our insides as we do our outsides, we'll be unstoppable. Have you ever wondered what it would feel like to wake up and not be at war with yourself or your body? Have you ever wondered what a penis would look like wearing a pink donut? I bet you have. (laughs) Those are two things we're going to be talking about today on the podcast with I am so happy to say this, my new friend and founder of The O-Nut, Emily Sawyer. Now, you've heard me talk about The O-Nut on the show before, and um, yes, I have an affiliate code. It is Alyssa7, A-L-I-S-S-A, number seven. Um, And the reason that I got an affiliate code is because I have been recommending The O-Nut to clients for years years because I, this piece of equipment, this tool, this toy, however you want to view it, is revolutionary for us and painful sex. Emily said it kind of looks like a pink donut (laughs) on a penis. Um, I think I've talked about it before, almost like um, when you're bowling and there's like bumper bowling. The O-Nut, well, Emily explains it in the episode, but it helps you control the depth of penetration during P in the V-sex or anything in the V-sex, sexual intercourse. So this small device of stacking silicone donuts really, really does help you know that you are safe It helps you know what you can expect. There's a physical barrier that penetration cannot go deeper than you've already decided. So you can once again feel safe in your body, know that you're not going to feel pain, and start to explore what it'll feel like to find pleasure or the possibility of pleasure between the sheets. I... When I reached out to Emily to be on the show, I was already fangirling because like I said, I have loved this product and recommending it to clients for years. And what I was not prepared, I don't know. I don't know what I expected, but I was so happily surprised, although I'm not surprised because someone who would create something like this in service of women experiencing painful sex is obviously awesome, but I was not prepared to meet my like new best friend. She is so fun. She is so warm. She is light and she is bright and she is changing the freaking world. She's educating and empowering women to reclaim their bodies, advocate for themselves and find pleasure and connection with themselves and their bodies and their and our partners to stop being at war with our private parts. And I'm totally obsessed with her and I cry twice in the episode. So I know you're going to love it. I mean, uh, something that really struck me from this conversation and I've continued to to think about is how we expect sex to be painful. And I'm saying this as a generalization because maybe you didn't expect that. But, like, think about back to, like, when people were losing their virginity or we were, like, learning about that. And I mean learning about that, like, talking to our friends who also had no idea what the hell they were talking about. And maybe we someone heard something from an older sibling. But I remember hearing, like, sex hurts the first time. It's going to hurt the first few times and then it gets better. I certainly was told that after having a baby. And what really struck me from this conversation is like, 
those are some of my first uh, lessons about sexual intercourse with a partner is that is to expect pain. Like, what is that doing? What if we learned about sex and we learned about it in terms of intimacy, in terms of sharing our body with someone else, in terms of finding pleasure together, where we're not like it shouldn't be painful unless you are with a partner where you are consensually deciding to integrate pain into your experience, in which case you have a safe word. So it's, it's again, it's still safe. Anyway, I've been thinking about this a lot and I know it will come up in future episodes. I'm working on some stuff from it. And it also really, really is resonating deeply with me because Today, the day this episode airs, would have been my 13th wedding anniversary with my first husband. And I think about how much, and I am not, I am not blaming him for anything with this. This is about me and the version of myself that I was at that, at that time, but about my expectations around sex, about how I showed up as a partner, which I am like making a weird face as I say that because I wasn't showing up as a partner in that realm. This, that's not, sex wasn't a way to become close and share intimacy and connect and be sweet and have fun and learn with my partner. It was um, transactional. It was an obligation. It was something I didn't, I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it. I mean, it was kind of neutral. And if you saw um, a story I told a stand-up uh, show that I performed in, um, it quite literally made me wretch. <laughs> um, I'll include, a, I'm laughing. I mean, it's funny now. It was not at the time. It's just the absurdity of it. And thinking back to this version of myself who didn't think to question that, who didn't question that, who continued that, and didn't actually realize how uh, misaligned that sort of reaction to sexual intercourse was until well after our divorce, until well after, really, I mean, I was already married <laughs> to Jeremy and we'd had Everett by the time I really reflected on this and thought about it and what that meant more more deeply, what that really was showing me about who I was, what I was taught, what I thought what was going on and how I also did not show up in that relationship because I didn't share any of this. I didn't share anything with anyone. So this conversation really means a lot to me and I am so honored to share it with you and I am so honored to share Emily with you and I cry again I cried twice in the episode and I really I cannot wait to hear what you think. If you are a subscriber over on Substack, you got the link to this to this episode in your inbox. And I would love if you have a moment to comment on that email or reply to it, comment on the post on Substack to um, let me know what you think. Let me know what resonates with you. And please, 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 please share this episode with someone you love. Share this episode with a friend. Share it with your, if you have someone you love who you know experiences painful sex, if you have a friend who you talk about these kinds of things with and sort of want to open the conversation, have you ever had an experience like this? Have you ever felt this way? The more that we normalize these conversations about the real stuff that's going on that we are not supposed to talk about, the more we are empowered to be comfortable and centered and 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 own our experiences, our truths, the female experience, and we can create change in the world because the more comfortable we are with this, the more comfortable the world is going to have to become. Emily, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm so good. I, uh, I I'm like, too much. I just got my period. Like, can I say that? Yes. 
Uh, yeah. I just had a baby, so it's it's like my hormones are all wacky. But it's been great because I'm keeping track of when my PMS is. So if I'm being mm-hmm. a total ass, I, I can kind of say, oh, this is why. Oh, yeah. And you can appropriately take ownership where you might need to take ownership. Because in Absolutely. those mom in that type of uh hormotional state uh yeah it, right it's 100 percent someone else's fault and then you can look mm-hmm. at it and be like okay i understand i am part of this it doesn't feel that way but you can just take ownership of your Absolutely. part of it you know i want to name i want to name my pms alter ego so i could just be like hey broom yes. is here and she's angry broom hilda i just think i don't know i just i like it <laughs> she's she's fierce she is very fierce She's not very nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh. I have an alter ego. Oh yeah. What are um, well, you know, it's funny because my husband jokes around that like he knows when she's around, but really mm. I think my current one is someone else. I think my my real alter ego, Melissa, I think she's dead now. Oh no. Um, but okay. that was the name like when I was in high school and we'd like get real ragey. You know, mm-hmm. just like teenage hormones, like you don't understand me the whole thing, and I like freak out. That was Melissa. Oh, nice. Okay. And and um, yeah, like in college, if I get like <laughs> like drunk and belligerent, like that was Melissa. Melissa, can't that's not me, Melissa. Um, and so it's funny. I th- I like almost think it's cute when Jeremy's like, "Oh, I've met Melissa," and I'm like, "You don't know Melissa. <laughs> like you don't understand how much I've." evolved like maybe this is like marissa oh, or like yeah. a something something else or like Alyssa with a y because i'm Alyssa mm. with an i mm-hmm, like mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. but yeah i mean we all have that beyonce is sasha fierce we all get to have we something all get to have an alter ego. yeah i mean i feel like melissa is melissa jealous that someone else kind of is coming in or is she is oh my is she god just, she's gone gone Oh my God! Is it? Is she dead or is she jealous? <laughs> she might just be pissed. Maybe. <laughs> She'd be like, I mean, "You don't know me. You don't know me. Do you want to get to know me? You don't want to get to know me." Like <laughs> maybe battle that's of the what alter she's ego. Doing. Oh my God! That's fantastic. I, I mean, love they're very that. real. They're very real persona, so I can totally see them duking oh. it. A hundred percent. I'm just here, and she's yeah. freaking out. She's like, "Who's walking on?" I'm picturing um, the thing that popped into my head was like the scene in Aladdin when the genie comes out the la- out of the lamp when and then Aladdin questions whether or not he can answer his wishes and he's like, "Did you wake me up? Did, did you, you rub me? my lamp? Did you?" Di- <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Right? That's what oh, Melissa's good. doing right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, she's like, she's not letting you go. Uh-uh. She's not. Okay. Well, thankfully, now I know what I'm talking about in therapy tonight. And... <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that. Oh, wow. Oh, Tell my gosh. I would... <laughs> Well, see, Emily, the 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 good that you are bringing into this world is knows no bounds. I mean, you're helping me figure out these, you know, parts of myself that are maybe in a fight and I didn't even realize it. And you are, you're changing the game around. Painful sex. Painful sex. I absolutely love what you just said. You're, what, you said, um, I'm, I'm in a fight with my parts and I didn't even realize it, which is totally applicable to the conversation about painful sex because oftentimes people don't even acknowledge it or, you know, outside sources of help don't acknowledge it. And so there is kind of this war against our parts in, in a way yes. or, uh, that really does need to be addressed. So if the good in the world is stopping the war with our parts, I tip my hat to it and you're, you're welcome, I guess. <laughs> uh, yes. yes, I totally agree. And I love that. Yeah. I mean, it's a war with our parts, our yeah. private parts, yeah. which also, I mean, that's my whole thing. Like, why are they so private? And I'm not saying this is you, I'm not saying that, any of us have to tell everyone about our vaginas. Like Mm. you don't, I also don't think everyone should be me where you do meet someone for the first time. And it doesn't take that long for me to bring up my butthole. Like, I don't think that everyone needs to operate that way. I probably don't need to operate that way. However, if there is something going on with your body, with your vagina or your butthole or anything else that you do need to talk about, you deserve a space to do so. Yeah. 
without judgment, without fear, without in a way that you well, with can learn about your body. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yes, it's 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 actually the opposite of all of those things that you're saying with a sense of optimism and hope and in, like inquiry. You know, there's so much that we're not taught. And so we have a world to learn about. And really, that's it's what's so exciting about my job working in the field of painful sex, because when people talk about it for the first time, like the floodgates just open. You yes. know, uh, so I created Onut. We can take like a like a quick commercial break yep. for Emily to say <laughs> what Onut is. Yes. <laughs> yes. Da, 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 da. Beep. All right, Which ladies I, and gentlemen. <laughs> I told you this. I've been recommending Onut to clients for years. Mm-hmm. So cool. also, super cool. Just, like I was already a big fan. Okay, so tell us about it. So Onut is a wearable vest designed for anyone who experiences pain when penetration goes too deep. So that like deep, sharp pain or, you know, that kind of like the deeper in the pelvic floor or deeper inside yeah. the body pain. Some people describe it as it feels like slamming into a brick wall. Totally. Absolutely. Other people have more, uh, not quite as a uh, aggressive experience, but well, some I people mean, do. Like hitting a brick wall, it feels like a knife, you know, it, it actually, yeah. it's funny the way that people describe it is actually quite aggressive. Yeah. Uh, and and it's it's also still interesting that even when we describe it that way to some providers, they don't respond, which is crazy that we have to go through that. But anyways, um, <laughs> back to the lighthearted part of our commercial. Uh, so all that is designed for anyone who experiences pain when penetration goes too deep. So the way that it works, it's these like squishy, stackable set of rings. Imagine like the Fisher Price donut stacking toy. Yes. Like that, like the rainbow donut stacking toy. Yes. It's like that. Okay, but it goes around a penis or any kind of penetrating partner. So these rings, they're worn at the, around the base of the penis or a dilator or a toy or a finger mm-hmm. pen. And during sex, what happens is that they compress down like a buffer. So they don't go inside of the body. And the fun part about it is that rings can be added or removed at any time during any position. So you can control exactly how much goes in. And there is something... I mean, what I'm about to say, there's part of me, I'm like, why are you even saying this? It's so obvious. But also at the same time, it is so important that uh, we can't stop saying it. What you just said, like where you are in control Mm. of how far it goes in. And when you are experiencing painful sex for whatever reason, to have that sense of control, to know that it will not go further than what Mm -hmm. has already been determined Mm -hmm. is... I mean, that's invaluable. That is life changing to then be able to build up a sense of safety. Yeah. Yeah. And some control Mm -hmm. in that experience that you're either with yourself or with a partner. That then is like huge huge to move through this thing. Right. And I'm I'm saying it that way. I'm not articulating it so beautifully, but like meaning that there's, there is impermanence to this there. You, it won't Mm. always be painful. You can move through it and building Mm -hmm. this sense of safety is what's going to get you there. Absolutely. I mean, so I I came up with this crazy idea, you know, I, I came up with it at a time when I was in a really bad mental space and I was not in a very healthy relationship. And so every time sex was painful, I just felt terrible about myself as a person, as a partner, I just, I wasn't, I had an identity crisis because I wasn't who I thought I was. And it Mm -hmm. was triggered very much during sex. And, you know, so I came up with this crazy idea uh, to, to maybe just put a pink frosted donut around a penis. Yeah. It was like the (laughs) antithesis of the way that I was feeling. And when I tried it for the first time, I felt all of a sudden that it wasn't my fault that I had the choice not to be in pain and that I had permission to feel good. For so long, for over 10 years, I looked for help and literally everything pointed to nothing. Doctors weren't helpful. I I went online and everything boasted bigger is better uh, or even products that could have been helpful boasted male performance. And then people were like, oh, well, you know, what kind of research did you find online? It's like, I didn't have the vocabulary to understand my body, to understand the complications. And when someone tells you to jump into a cold pool, you're not like, cool, let me try. 
<laughs> you know, you're like, oh, no way I'm jumping into a cold pool. Yeah. So, so to come up with this very simple idea and then to try it out and to have it be this catharsis, deep catharsis for me, the, the shame that I was feeling, the silence that I had felt for so long, I never told anyone about it. Just one. Of course not. Oh, wow. Of course. Of Everyone's course having not. the best sex ever. I'm, you know, of I'm, course, because that would have been in it. That would have been an admission of all this other garbage. And, uh, the, and you're not supposed to. Yeah. There's not really a conversation about this. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, anyway. We're taught like when, <laughs> whenever you're first going to have like penetrative intercourse, mm-hmm. like I remember being like, oh, it's going to hurt. Mm. Everyone just says it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt for a while and then it gets great. Yeah. yeah. And so that was the expectation is not even like, okay, don't expect to like maybe have an orgasm the first time. Cause you're probably just, you know, whatever, but like it's going to hurt. So it's not even going to feel good. And then it's the same load of trash yeah. after you have a baby. Yeah. Yeah. To Absolutely. have a couple glasses of wine and get through it. I mean, well, and then the the problem is, is that we end up with an entire population with legitimate medical concerns that go ignored for an extended period of time. So whatever yes. might be the preliminary cause of pain, whatever might be going on physiologically, psychologically, the whole constellation of things going on, if that goes unaddressed, then it gets compounded exponentially even you know for you it's know, just yeah. snowballing it's Absolutely. yeah it's just exponentially getting bigger deeper your body is then learning that response your body yeah. is learning that also that this this act this thing that's supposed to be so filled with pleasure is actually painful so Anything that might feel like pleasure, your brain gets confused because yeah. pleasure hurts. Mm-hmm. And then it's also you're bracing yourself for it. So it hurts more. And then mm-hmm. you're just like, I want to push through. And this is some, like you said, something's wrong with me. Then, yeah. then you are in a fight with all of your parts yeah. when really what's going on is like you're saying there there's a real issue. There is an answer. There is a root cause. And it. When it comes to pelvic floor, listen, chicken or the egg, whatever, it's, <laughs> it is physical and emotional. Yeah. I'm sorry. I did there. I have yet to work with someone and I've worked with like thousands of men and mostly women, but men also with pelvic floor dysfunction and every single there's, there is no one that is not having a huge emotional situation as well. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's even, it, it's called the, the biopsychosocial model. So biological is body yes. integrity, hormones, psychological is, you know, how are you feeling about yourself? How are you feeling about your relationship? Uh, biopsycho- and social, you know, how, how do you view sex in a so- social, like in a cultural context? Yeah, and how do you then even? feel that you fit in in this cultural context? I know Absolutely. I love that. The first time someone said that to me, it was Lindsay Vestal. She's a pelvic floor yeah. occupational therapist. And I was like, oh my God, Lindsay, are you flirting with me? <laughs> Biopsychosocial, get out of here! That is your boss. I know. <laughs> but it's when when you can think about it holistically like that, it, it also just helps with the the approach to finding a solution. Because yes, you know, a vibrator is not going to fix any kind of complication. You know, is there an issue in the relationship? Is there an underlying fear? You, you have, looking at all these different factors in a biopsychosocial model can help address. Tell yes, a and, bit. and on top of that, is there, um, are you on hormonal birth control? Is there a hormone mm-hmm. imbalance? What are you, is there something going on in your diet that your body is also having a reaction, whether it's increased inflammation or increased vaginal dryness, which is contributing to the pain and layering on top of it. So then it's all just worse and worse. There's, and that's something, you know, mm. I think this is something you and I uh, touched on, and this is a, this is like the perfect spot where we could get really like critical of all the doctors. Oh, yeah. We could, uh-huh. you know, and I'm not saying, listen, I've seen some doctors who are not good. Yeah. Um, I've also seen phenomenal doctors. I've also, like, we know that you don't go through that many years of school and training to not treat people. 
to not help take care of people, right? But there's so much missing in the system, in their education, in the medical system itself, right. that, and it's all like, I, from my perspective, I feel like it's all so segmented and viewed so in such a linear fashion mm-hmm. that something like painful sex, which can have so, again, like there's so many things that can contribute to why you are having yeah. this symptom, mm-hmm. but like to get a diagnosis like vaginismus takes forever. Endometriosis, yeah. it takes forever because yeah. it requires so much overlap. It's this holistic, it's a holistic situation. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's, it's interesting. You know, a lot of people, it was new news to me as I was going through the process of creating this company and developing a scientific advisory board is actually learning what an OB- OBGYN is taught. And they're actually yes. taught to treat infection, disease, and childbirth for the most part. OBGYN, infection, disease, and childbirth. Not pain, not chronic pain, and particularly not sex. So if something doesn't show up on a sonogram, for example, they're not really taught to treat it it's or, or not to, to really their like dig deeper into job it. they it's they're job. and they're not trained for it they're not prepared for it they yeah. might see that but they're that isn't and it's those aspects of these types of situations that women find themselves in i don't want to say like di- say diagnoses as like a blanket thing because you could have a diagnosis it could be i i, I i'm not a doctor i mm-hmm. am not a doctor i'm a doctor of nothing um is that it's just falling between the cracks of like everyone else is sort of like that's someone else that's not my I don't I'm not prepared maybe this person is maybe that person is and it kind of falls through the cracks and you know it's interesting you say that because I came to that same realization now I love my OBGYN who delivered Everett wonderful I love her as a human I love her as a practitioner and after my fourth degree tear I spent I've told her this I spent some time in my brain at war with my parts trying to blame her yeah yeah because at that point listen it was very early i was traumatized i was there was a lot of hormones there was a lot there was a lot going on and i needed somewhere to direct it but even as like in my head i was like pointing fingers i was like i there's something like that isn't the truth like this is what i'm feeling right now like okay but like i also know that that's not really it and it was over time because also i'm friends with her so we chatted i talked to her about my birth i talked to her about what was going on and i realized that i was my expectations were for her to be a doula and a physical Mm -hmm. therapist and my mom and my best friend and all these things were also thank god she's a brilliant surgeon because my Mm -hmm. two hole works beautifully right oh my god mazel that's great right (laughs) yeah Yes. You know, Baruch Hashem, everything's functioning. <laughs> Very important. Very important. But it's that distinction of like, yeah. I think that we, th- we, I, is anybody clear on who does what? No, I mean, that's, that's the, the biggest thing is that people don't know what their options are. So, you know, OBs, yes. again, infection, disease, childbirth. If you go to a pelvic floor PT, they're much more, uh, tr- they're much better trained to actually facilitate di- the diagnostic process because they're yes. more familiar with the musculoskeletal system. Uh, yeah. And they yeah. can direct you to the doctor who sends those pe- who, t- who treats medically those people with the thing to support the holistic. Yes. The, the pro- recovery for sure. for resolution. Sure. And, and the whole, yes. Bow on the top. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's so interesting because it's like, what is, what is the process of, navigating pelvic pain and painful sex. And it's like, what do we do first? Well, we have to acknowledge it for ourselves first. And that's like, here today, we are talking 75% of women will have painful sex in their lifetime. And let me tell you, that is only those who've reported it. It is uh, likely yes. much higher. Okay? Yeah. So I think that, if you talk to any woman, she'd be like, yeah, yeah I've had that. For sure. Oh, right? God, it was amazing. When I started ONUT, uh, a couple of friends called me up and they're like, hey, I have been, ooh, my earphone just got popped <laughs> my, my tooth fell out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, people, a couple of friends called me and they were like, I've actually been having pain during sex and I didn't even realize it. You know, if, if we're having sex and we're, we're like pushing, putting our hands between our legs and pushing our partner away or like squeezing your legs or kind of avoiding certain positions, there's something going on that might be worth taking a closer look at. And again, that doesn't mean that something's broken. It doesn't mean that no. it's forever. But it does mean that there's you know something that you can do about it. And the longer you wait, 
the more complicated it might become. So totally. there's the there's the seeing your provider part of it, which is again like you know seeing a provider, the appropriate provider is definitely a hurdle. But you know we're getting there, uh, yeah, slowly but surely. We are getting there. People yeah. are talking about this more, and I think there's also a sentiment that like we. I'm saying we like the patient, like if I bring Mm. it up, like I'm not going to let this go. Like I understand now that like there's something, this is not the rest of my life. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, it's, it's so interesting because that it's, there's that, there's, there's the, there's that interim period because say you do find a provider that is helpful. The path to healing might take a while. And that is actually where ONA generally comes in because say you're seeing a pelvic floor physical therapist, you're doing exercises, you're doing manual therapy, you name it, sex might still be painful. What can you do in the meantime? So having this very like low risk, fun to use, you know, way to have sex is, is actually, it does a couple of things. It it gives you something to do, which a lot Mm. of people find helpful when they're like waiting, that feeling of waiting. Yeah. And something that you can do, but it also like, allows you to feel the progress that you are making allows you to really actively participate in reinforcing like this is changing this is in motion right now like we're not stuck anymore i don't like maybe i'm not sure exactly where i'm at or where i'm going but i'm not where i was and when you're experiencing painful sex that's awesome that it's not that yeah. You'll yeah. take anything but that. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it's, and when, when the opportunity arises and, and if ONET works for you, the, the, that pain not occurring isn't just the absence of pain. It is a rediscovery of a new side of yourself. It is connecting with a partner again. It is communicating. You know, we have the reviews on our website are wild because there's really nowhere online to talk about painful sex except Reddit, maybe. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so people talk about, you know, I had a hysterectomy and, and then now I have, I'm able to have sex or I had postpartum prolapse, you know, uh, yeah. kinds of endo, fibroids, just any kind of vaginismus or certain kinds of vaginismus. But <laughs> what's, what's really wonderful is it's opening the dialogue. Oh, no, it's opening a dialogue, not just for, people who are experiencing the discomfort, but also for partners as well. Uh, yes. 35% of our customers are men, which just goes to show that partners want to help. They do. They want to do something, yes. but they don't know how. Yes. And it, oh God, it's just so good. <laughs> it's well, just yes. so good. Like, I mean, I'm partial because talking about painful sex, pelvic floor dysfunction, the biopsychosocial like aspects of all of this, like, oh my God, where our physical and emotional bodies are like, this is my jam. And like this, that, that you're seeing, we are seeing that there is a desire for this conversation that once the floor is open, the floodgates open are like they are they're gone they're gone and i found that when i started pilates for your privates which is you know pilates for pelvic health which um i assumed that i was going to get all pregnant and postpartum people and that i was like oh i guess that'll be cool because like i definitely want to have a baby so this will also be really great because i know this but then i'll like see it in action so i'll feel even more prepared and like i did hear from some moms but immediately I heard from tons of women experiencing painful sex or who, you know, were in a position where they weren't able to tolerate any penetration or wear a tampon or any anything. And were in that place that that place that you described of earlier of just like isolation yeah. of this is just something that's wrong with me. Mm -hmm. This is a problem. This is, I'm a problem. No one's going to, you know, it's put, it's creating issues in their relationships and with other people, but certainly inside their own body with themselves. And it really is incredible when we tap into this and connect into our, connect to our bodies in this way, especially because we're not supposed to talk about our vaginas. 
Mm-hmm. We're not supposed to talk about the pelvic floor. We're supposed to be ashamed and disgusted and secretive and virgins and pure. And like your body's not supposed to smell like a body or behave like a body. <sighs> right. right? It's just like, I don't know. It's supposed to be dry and tight. That's yeah. not what it's supposed. That's literally not what it's supposed to be. That's a, that is a sign that something is not functioning optimally. Um, yeah. And when I really have seen this transformation in other people and then experienced it really, really intensely after having ever and recovering from my tear that like when you get in touch with this, I know, you know what I'm talking about. Like watch out world. Watch out world. I mean, that's, it started a company. I, like I literally told everyone that I had painful sex and people wanted to help, you know, it, and it, after how many years of not talking about it over 10, All and I, of them. I never told any partner as yeah. well. No one, no one knew. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the, uh, again, bringing the partner into the conversation, there's so much fear Mm -hmm. around uh, maybe there's an incompatibility in the relationship. Maybe this is going to change how we work out. But ultimately, I'm like losing my train of thought. Hold on. I'm going to, does this get edited? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But also like, I don't know. We could leave it in. No, we'll edit it this. No, no, it's not okay. Um, Bringing the partner we, in. Yeah, I mean, we often forget that good sex is vulnerability, and that can often be terrifying, absolutely terrifying. But once yeah. we step into that place and and we have that conversation before we have sex, we're there goes my there goes my tooth. My tooth fell out again. <laughs> 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 Sorry, guys. Um, it, it really it, it changes the depth of the relationship in a very significant way uh, to have something back that you thought you lost to have a part of yourself again that you thought you that was gone forever um, or maybe that you just didn't have yeah yeah you didn't get that I do have a, a testimonial that I would love to read if that's okay Please. Okay. Says, Dear Emily, sometimes sex breaks down my confidence because my body doesn't work the way I want it to. Recently, my partner sat me down and begged me to talk about when and how sex was painful for me because he knew that I was uncomfortable but wasn't saying anything. It's hard for me to break the habit of silence after years of not speaking up, but I love my partner even more because he shows me love even when I don't love myself. Well, that one gets me every time. <laughs> That's I'm crying also. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> it's, it's I true. do. I, yeah. I, this speaks to so many things about what we are taught to believe and conditioned to feel as yeah. women. And we, like, <sighs> that we are so... Like, we can't believe that there'd be a partner who would be in that kind of thing with us. Yeah. Because it's, it, it, I don't know, at least I can speak really only for myself, um, although I've spoken to other people about these topics, but, like, I definitely, like, my pleasure wasn't something I feel like I knew going into when I started having sex that, like, that was, like, a priority. It was for the guy. You know, and I was there for that. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, so, yeah. The reason why people don't bring up sex is uh, pain during sex is because, um, again, the pain is normalized. Uh, we consider the pain to be inconsequential, like it's no big deal. Uh, kind of like what you were just talking about, prioritizing the partner's enjoyment. That can change the entire dynamic completely because us being good at sex is being good for the other partner. Yeah, um, and then there are gendered pressures that yeah. are normalized for like what role do we play during that sexual experience? Uh, and I mean, my my hope is that if nothing else, even if you don't ever buy or touch Onut or whatever, just knowing that something exists that because enough people have this experience and enough people want to know and learn about it and use this as a jumping off place, as a catalyst for dialogue. Like, oh, there's this yeah. crazy bumper that, that <laughs> you know, controls penetration. That like, It sounds kind of silly. It's like, you know, you were saying it's like bumper bowling. Yeah, uh, I did describe it. <laughs> I did 
did that in one in uh I was talking about Ona in a previous episode and I said that's how it works. It's like bumper bowling. So it keeps yeah. you in the lane so it that you can have a successful it, go. How much fun is that? But <laughs> I, it, if whatever we can do to start that conversation is just the best the best thing that you can do. You know, if you've had the experience, Amen. maybe like bring it up casually to a friend. If you're with a partner, maybe like, hey, you know, I've had this, I don't know if we, you know, and then, and then develop a dialogue around, you know, I, I didn't even realize this until recently. It's, it's really hard to talk about painful sex while it's happening. And I realized that if it does come up for me uh, again, nowadays, I say like, hang on, like, oh, hang on mm-hmm. one sec. And because it's still like, yeah. you know, I don't really want to say like, oh, this is painful. It feels like I'm going to ruin the moment. But having this shared understanding of what's going on really creates space to then make adjustments. And simple and, adjustments that feel good for everybody. And you you open the space for your partner to then be right there with you yeah. and be like, how can I help? Oh, yeah. Oh, what do ooh, you need? Again. Oh, <laughs> my God. Yeah. Like, yeah. take me now. Is there anything Absolutely. to order? What do you need? How can I help? Oh, Girl. yes. Is this, is this okay? Like, just I'll whisper that Stop. in my ear. Stop. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, that's what I'm talking about. It's so, it's so true. And and then the thing is, it's kind of like boiling, like really internalizing that. And and because painful sex can cause rifts in, in a relationship where hand-holding might mean, hey, I want to have sex. Where making out might be internalized is like, hey, I want to have sex right now. So when, when we start to turn away those basic gestures of intimacy under the assumption yeah. that ex- that sex is expected, we lose a significant part of our relationship. So yes. how can we start to open ourselves back up to s- sweetness? I love everything about you and what you're doing. And I want to encourage you listening to maybe have a conversation today around this and it is listen it's a taboo topic and i'm not saying like you don't have to tell people about your vagina if you don't want to tell people about your vagina but maybe it starts with sharing this episode with someone or saying i heard a podcast today about a dick donut like have you ever heard (laughs) of a dick donut and open up the conversation and share Share the love, share the love because see what, these, happens. See what happens because yeah. I have a, I, I know like this is how we change the whole landscape around women's health, women's reproductive health and sexuality. Absolutely. And it really, it's, it's each and every one of us talking about it. Totally. Oh. There is, there's one last thing that I would love to read if that's okay. Yes. Uh, it is so when I was looking for solutions during like the whole before the company began, I couldn't find any brand that understood what I was going through. And so everyone who comes in contact with the brand, it is my goal to make sure that everyone feels validated and whole. So in the box, uh, there's a letter from me. And I just wanted to read that letter. It says, you made it. A big congratulations, not only on your new ONET, but also on all the hard work that led you here. The journey is never easy. I tell you with my full heart, you are sexy exactly the way you are. You're a problem solver, a shoulder to lean on, a spreader of joy. You put a lot of love out there and you deserve to live that love you share. So in the spirit of curiosity, embrace adjustment, awkward moments, and small, mighty victories. And know deep down, but not too deep, that you're doing great. Now go play. All of my love, Emily. I'm crying again. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me and listening to the end of this episode. Look at you. You're someone who finishes what they start. I love that about you. And if you're picking up what I'm laying down, be sure to visit me over at alyssaalter.com for more resources on how you can alter your life, like downloading the five-minute meditation that I use to start my day with confidence and ease, all before getting out of bed. See you next week.